Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. I've um, admired Miguel's work for years um, from a distance, um, literally over Twitter. Uh, and uh, if you haven't read his book, uh, Theater as Data, it's amazing. And I recommend everyone grab a copy. And it's open access. So um, I just want to say it's a real honor to be here and a part of this. And to all the organizers, thank you so much for all the work. It takes a team to do these kind of events. So I just want to acknowledge the labor and, kind and generosity of everyone here at NUS for including uh, for all you've done to make this possible for today and tomorrow um, and Friday. And I'm, I'm excited to hear everyone else's work who's here presenting as well. So um, today I'm going to start by talking a little bit about um, sort of where I'm coming from, uh, a little bit positionality about DH and study of US culture, then talk a bit about this concept and method of distant viewing and then dive a little bit into a case study looking specifically at photography from the early 20th century in the US, and then talk a little bit about some of the capacity building that's required around some of this work. Um, and I offer these examples hoping that if you have an image corpus that you are excited about, that you'll think about it through the lens of whatever images are exciting you or you're thinking for your scholarship. And everything I'll talk about today can also be applied to time-based media or moving images, so film, television, even if I focus on still images for today. So just a little thing about that. So a bit about where I'm coming from. Um, I, I did, I'm a, my field is digital humanities. And for those who are familiar, it's always a precarious decision to try to define the digital humanities. But I will offer using Kathleen Fitzpatrick's definition that it's a nexus of fields within which scholars use computing technologies to investigate the kinds of questions that are traditional to the humanities or ask traditional kinds of humanities-oriented questions about computing technologies. And I put an asterisk by the traditional because I like to think that we can ask some new questions as well and add some new theories. But I think that the important part is that flip side. We don't just use computational methods. We think critically about what those computational methods are doing as well, which I think connects really great to the earlier conversation about using data for computational methods and then bringing all the critical apparatuses of the humanities to be careful about where we put our data in the first place, right? Think about power, uh, capitalism, consumer culture, you know, all the elements of power that come behind capturing people's data, right? That comes from the humanities. So um, just a little bit too, a lot of our work focuses on 20th and 21st century US, um, US history and US culture and visual culture. So just so you know, that's kind of the lens where I'll be coming from is from a, a American, my training's in American studies. So just as a note about that, that a lot of our work does focus on US media. But I think the power of distant viewing is that it's a really open right now about work that can be done um, from all kinds of different cultural and geographical locations about what we could do with image analysis. We're just scratching the surface of what's possible. So what do I mean by distant viewing? What am I talking about? So what we're doing is we're, this book that we're about to come out with MIT um, is a book that theorizes and provides a method that we call distant viewing. And it's about at theorizing how computers see images. In other words, how the computer computer vision works. So computer vision focuses on how computers can be made to gain high level understandings from digital images or videos. Um, and we use these computational methods that try to replicate elements of the human visual system. Computer vision is oriented toward human seeing. Other animals see in different ways. Computer vision is really a human-centered way of seeing. Other animals can see in different color co combinations, right, other ways. Computer vision is built around us and uh, around our ways of seeing. And often this leads to claims that computer vision is neutral. Well, we just see things, right? Um, and we know this if it's computational and it's, logic, uh, it's computational, often people tend to think it's unbiased or it just, it's a, more objective in some way. Yet I, we start from the premise that computer vision is built around the ideas of human visuality, which is already a perspective that is already a decision. And we use it in all kinds of spaces often, right? We see it um, used in our phones, Google, um, surveillance um, uh, technologies. Uh, you can't, a lot of our social media has turned very visual, Instagram, TikTok, 
very little of it's actually text now, very much of a visual apparatus. And they're using computer vision algorithms to suggest other content to you, to identify your friends, the new iPhone, iPhone photos now. You can identify by objects now. Has anyone started doing that, where you put in words like dog or living room? or more complex semantic concepts. If you do that search in your photos now, that's all computer vision. Airports, landing gear, all that stuff. Uh, arenas are using it, uh, even clubs. If you are on the do not enter list at your favorite club in um, say Paris, you know, a city like New York, and you've been banned, some of them have computer vision to be like, you can't be, you're no longer allowed in here. This is happening at arenas. Um, and then also we've got this world of generative AI that, uh, that's creating fake images like these people on the right who are sort of way in the world of the uncanny valley on the right. And if you see them closer, they have like six fingers. It's very creepy, like teeth to hear. Uh, the, let's just say the general, uh, the AI for computer vision um, has some different questions in some of the chat GPT conversations or transformer models. So what if we bring the analytical frames of media studies to reframe and theorize computer vision. Where might we go from there? What if we take that whole apparatus of the humanities? So the fundamental question that an image asks, a computer vision does, is it says, what is this an image of? So you take a JPEG or a TIFF file or some image and you put it in your computer and some algorithms are going over it and they're like trying to say, answer that question. What is this an image of? Is it an image of a person or is it a man? Is it a person of animals? Is it a person of a horse and a dog? Is, it a per is this a photo of outdoors? Is it a photo of prairies? What is this an image of? Is this an image of loyalty? Is this an image of, right? So all these questions become the problem that computer vision often try is trying to solve, which is, what is this an image of? And you and I do this very, very quickly. We do this in seconds, right? We process the world around us. And then we use the cultural and social ways of knowing things that we read those images through, right? Think about um, the ways that you want, we interpret through our visual systems that are cultural, culturally and socially informed. So to, so for, to put this a little in a different way, what they, but, but what the computer actually sees is these pixels on the left. It's a series, it's a grid of numbers it doesn't actually see the image. So can anyone guess what this is an image of on the right? This is what the computer is trying to do. It's trying to figure out, it's going circulating around little areas of the image, trying to figure out what's happening. Can anyone guess what that might be? An eye. An eye. Any other? It could be a mouth. Okay, yeah, it could be the mouth of the... Um, when I've given this without any context, some people have said a spoon. Right? It could be any, it could be a, but in this case, we start to zoom out and zoom in and we see it's the eye of the horse. But then the, we have the added complexity that unlike when you do text analysis, if I write out the word I, E-Y-E, -E, it's kind of one phrase or code for that concept. But for every image, if the I turns a little this way, or 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 this way, the pixel count changes every time based on that square, because it has to do with different colors of the pixels. So for every image or every concept, if something as simple as an eye, there could be an unlimited number of pixel counts that could be the same concept, unlike with text, which is what makes it so computationally challenging and big as well to work with. So unlike those letters and words that we have these kind of socially, socially mediated forms, they have basically have a code system Images lack a formal code system, and we cannot unambiguously group and describe those collections of pixels. We have to actually go and we build algorithms that say, take these series of pixels and give them a label, give them a concept. We do what's called annotating. We have to annotate them. If you're familiar with methods of text analysis like topic modeling, document clustering, you don't have to give a code system. You can wait to say what those, picks, what those letters mean. You cannot do that with images. Images have to have some sort of annotation system. They have to, you have to build the code system through 
the, do the algorithms. You can't delay it in the way text analysis can. So actually, the way computer vision's working is it's formally and computationally working differently even than text analysis is. So um, when we have those annotations, then once we now have to decide what those annotations will be. So we tend to map them onto things or concepts that we as people and society, social, have decided are important, such as brightness. We tend to be really interested if an image is bright or lighter. Um, we have faces, objects, people, um, man, horses, cups, chairs, things we want to be able to understand. And so what we do is we say, hey, algorithm, go look at those series of pixels and try to give them some sort of label or annotation that tells me what that means. And that's what we have to do. And we do this algorithmically. And we can do this with, say, some code. This is the distant viewing toolkit that we've been building to make things easier for humanities scholars in particular to do this kind of work. And we might do things such as um, in region segmentation, where we say indoor, uh, we say what's in the foreground and the background. We might do pose, where you can start to see um, movement in the body. Um, we might do object detection, face detection. And we can do all these different ways of doing that um, as well. And then part of, the, part of the project right now then is all these people are working to try to figure out what kinds of ways of seeing, what kinds of ways do we want computer vision to look at things? Which ways do we want it to view? Um, this is just an image from work with our, um, uh, from uh, doing image analysis with um, sitcoms uh, from the 1960s. So, so to the computer, the image is a set of pixels. And for a computer to see and view the media, we have to build these algorithms that assign a meaning to pixels. And we have to build that code system, which is actually interesting because and one of the challenges is that we've been inheriting a lot of those algorithms from other groups. And so one of the things that you'll hear me keep saying is that I think this is a really exciting time for humanities scholars and even social scientists and other fields, because I think we need to be in the project of building these algorithms to see differently, to actually make them build them in the ways that we care about based on the things that we are exciting us. So that's a theory that we've been working on. It's, this is much more grounded in a ton of semiotics and media studies theory, Stuart Hall, Bartz, and friends. Um, but that's a kind of quick overview of a longer point about this theory of distant viewing, that a computer vision can be understood as a computational mode and technology of communication that transmits a message between the material interests and human audiences. In other words, people must assign the ways that computers see and view. There's nothing neutral here. And the ways we see and view are socially and culturally politically constructed, right? They're within frames of economic capitalism. There are all these frames of ways of seeing and practices of looking that we embed in these algorithms. And if we think of it that way instead, we no longer can say they're neutral. We can say that more people need to be at the table. And we need to think about who owns them and dominates them, which ways of seeing are dominant powers, and which ways do we need to disrupt them and, and see in new ways. And so that is the idea here, is to really say, when you are doing, you have, you have this tool called computer vision, and what you are doing is distant viewing. Computer vision is a tool. Distant viewing is a social, political, theoretical um, thing that we are actually in, act in action with. So that's the theory part. I'll uh, pause for a second. Are there any questions? And I'll, I can keep going. Yeah. Why distance? What, what is that metaphor doing for you? Sure. So a few things. One is uh, we talk about it as distance from the eye. So we're not, it's not the eye that's actually seeing. It's the computer, the number. So there's a distance between you and the eye. Um, and the other is uh, we often talk about doing this at, like, it tends to be something you do at scale. Um, so one of the things, uh, thinking about, like, the environmental cost of computer vision. So computer vision and our machine learning is costing us huge ecological parts, right? This is a huge cost on both how you make the machines. Um, so we tend to say we, we tend to do it when we have more data so that we don't have this environmental, that we account for the environmental impact of all this work. So that's kind of the two pieces. And it's kind of a riff off distant reading. So for those who are familiar with the distant reading conversation. But we do not subscribe to any of the distant reading work that says it's somehow neutral or biological, as some folks have said. I think we're past that debate, but 
you know, a few people hold on to it. For If you're interested in the weeds of that debate, we can, you know, it's, it's great tea conversation, I promise. Um, so, okay. So what does that look like in action? I'm going to give you, um, so the second, part of the things that we've done is turn this into a method. So uh, one of the things we, so, um, thinking about this from a data science perspective and DH perspective. So one thing we can do is annotate the corpus algorithmically using and adapting computer vision and machine learning algorithms to create and identify the code system. So we annotate, the, we take images, we annotate them with our, our code, our decisions. We organize the annotations um, and then we add it, the metadata in, right? Images often come with all kinds of other information that we want to organize that with. And then we explore the data with visualizations, models, summary statistics, and other, like EDA being exploratory data analysis is kind of our main frame for that. And then communicate the results, such as through public projects, scholarly venues, or in other sort of ways of communication. Um, so I'll turn to an example of how we applied the method for an area, our area, one of our interests, which is uh, 1930s photography. Um, some of you might recognize these images. How many folks recognize some of these images? Okay, yeah. So these are some of the most iconic photographs of the Great Depression in the US from the 1930s. The middle is Dorothea Lange's migrant mother, which is maybe one of the most famous photographs of the 20th century from the United States. And they, um, were, they were part of a collection that the federal government actually undertook. So the United States federal government in the 1930s funded a series of photographers to go around the nation and photograph um, to justify the New Deal. The New Deal was a series of legislation that was uh, to help people come out, uh, grapple with the economic effects of the Depression help them with things like farms, relocation, new mechanizing, other things to try to help the nation. Uh, and it immediately became under attack from particularly Republicans who said that it was too socialist and too, um, too much support for people. So the federal government under the leadership of Franklin Roosevelt um, said we need to persuade people that, this set of that these policies are worthwhile. So they hired a series of photographers. And they started to send photographs back to Washington, DC. Coming, and they started to come from people like Dorothea Lange, Walker Evans, Gordon Parks. Uh, these would be, again, some of the most iconic, uh, important documentary photographers of the 20th century in the US. So the scholarship has really focused on three areas. They said that these photographers went out and they went into the American South. So this is uh, the southern, su southern side, uh, southeast of the United States. And they just documented people who were really impoverished. And they went through the Dust Bowl, and they documented people who were very much uh, impoverished. And they only did it in rural areas. They didn't really go to cities. They kind of stuck to rural places where people had been farming or had been doing sort of agricultural work. And some have argued that this, that this uh, uh, our, this collection was a technocratic and bureaucratic propaganda that produced n progress narratives for the government. They were just like tools of the state. They just went out there and they just did what the government said. Um, but if we can actually, by looking at the images and metadata as a whole, do these characterizations hold? Does that sort of way the scholarship has talked about this, one of the, again, one of the most important photography collections in the US and one of the most studied, um, does, it, does that hold? And Roy Stryker, who founded this group, said, hey, the work we did can only be appreciated when the collection is considered as a whole. The total volume is staggering and has a richness and distinction that simply cannot be drawn from the individual pictures themselves. So we said, what if we grabbed all the data from the Library of Congress and we moved past the same 5, 10, 30 photographs that everybody studies. There's about 30, 40 photographs that get studied over and over and over and over again. And we move to the 170,000 photos that are in the collection. What if we scaled up and looked at the collection as a whole? So as I already said, they said this part about the rural poverty and the, uh, 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 documenting rural life and then bureaucratic propaganda. 
So we decided to annotate the images with some, out some of our computer vision algorithms to do some distant viewing. So the first step of the method is to annotate. So in this case, we did one called an image segmentation algorithm. So every pixel is associated with one of the following. It's either object or it's stuff. So objects are things you can count, like chairs uh, or things like that. Stuff is things that you can't count, like a wall or a floor or a sky. And this is a huge development in computer vision to do this. A lot of our work in computer vision up until about three, two to three years ago um, was focused on things you could count, like people, cars, light posts. You know, think of the apparatuses of the, what we need for self-driving cars. It's about like counting and identifying individual objects. So this opened up a whole new set of things to think about indoors and outdoors, uh, human-made natural. This is a kind of a semantic layer uh, that's one level up from a lot of the object detection work that's been done until about two to three years ago. And this opened up some possibilities for thinking about foreground and background, focus, compositional elements, right? And then if you're doing visual culture, it's not just what's in the front. If you want to know what's in focus, but also what's behind is really important as well. And if you think about how we see, we don't just count objects. We're putting them in relation to each other, what's in the foreground, what's in the background. So we did that and started to annotate. And um, we started to look at the ground and the floors and the furniture and to think about who it was indoors, what was outdoors. And we manually checked some of the results. And then we started to organize the images with their metadata. So for these photos, we have metadata about um, their uh, photographer, the date, the location, and a caption, as well as like type of film and a few other elements, which is really amazing metadata and we're really grateful to the US Library of Congress. Um, which is one of our big um, national institutions for this work. And then we just started to explore themes. So how many photos are indoors, how, are outside? How many photos have people? And we started to see some trends. So the collection starts to move from the outside to the inside, to indoors. And we started to look at it by photographer. And one of the things we saw was that the photos not only went from the Great Depression, but they went well into World War II. And you started to see that the photos move from outdoors to indoors. And so that kind of tracked onto the government shifts gears and, uh, at the onset of World War II. They're saying, hey, um, we need to show where, you know, we need to move from showing images of poverty to images of a strong nation ready for war. So go do that. OK, so that sort of tracks onto that. Uh, and, but then we started to look a little closer at some of the photographers. And we're like, OK, that sort of tracks. But if we started to look a little closer at who did indoor photography, another kind of picture comes into play. We start to see that individual photographers got inside, but they didn't just go into the factories. They used their subject positionality to, to, to document parts of US culture that were not always what the, what the government wanted to see. So the top is um, Gordon Parks, who it turned out was an African-American photographer. And he got access to the homes of people who worked in Washington, DC uh, during segregation to document their living conditions amid a, a nation at war that was supposed to be coming together while showing the deep divides and segregation that d defined American life. And so it's, he, they go indoors, but they go indoors in a very, very different way. Then we also start to see some of the female photographers get, are able to have access indoors in also a very different way. So a lot of the um, male photographers stick to um, the kind of factories and, and, and workshop floor. And women start to get access to spaces where women um, outside of Washington, DC, who are working, who are alone, and get into their bedrooms, get into their, like, their, their dorms to see what life's like for them working for the, uh, working, um, for the war effort. And so there's like a visual intimacy that they get to move indoors in a different way that the other photographers can't move indoors. So it's this combination of using computer vision to say, oh, wow, we didn't really think of them as moving indoors in that way, and then thinking about the positionality of the photographers to see how they're opening up totally different ways of seeing during uh, the, uh, as the war um, goes on. So we broadly see that this sort of maps onto some of the expectations, but we see photographers who start to disrupt that way of seeing from the government. They, just, they, make, they choose a different path. 
than, the, than they, they were told to go. And they were able to document parts of American life that were uh, not always what the, um, government uh, officials were hoping to have documented. Um, another was to look at photographer style. So one of the neat things about this, these um, image segmentations is because you can get foreground, background, and you can do things like sky and ground, you can actually now start to track the camera in the ways it's focusing up or down and to the side. And so by being able to see how much visual space, um, whether the camera is looking up or around, it actually opens up um, ways of seeing the angle of images. Um, you can imagine this being important for art as well, other types of film. If you wanted to do this to film, does the camera always have a woman and she's always looking up to her, or are they always looking down on her? We can think of like Laura Mulvey's work about the gaze, the male gaze and in, in images. So this ability to now have this foreground, background, up and down opens up a new way of seeing the tilts and angles of the cameras that we can now do at scale in a way that was, um, you, we have to, you had to like manually annotate this. This is what people used to do. And so this is Esther Bubble. And one of the things that's cool, interesting about her, and I looked at her work a lot, was I started to realize once we saw the algorithms um, that she's always um, looking up to her subjects. So she's actually constantly tilting the camera up. And we can do this with the sky ground. So we can see the amount of sky in the images indicates that the camera's angled a bit, and we start to see her always looking up to her subjects. And she does this relatively um, commonly, and uh, she, um, and she uh, I mean, she really like conveys the monumentality of DC through this. And I'll say I noticed this, I went to the Living Pictures um, uh, uh, exhibition at the National Gallery here, which is amazing, by the way. And there's a, um, a male photographer who's documenting a series of family photos. And it was so interesting. Every photograph they had in their house, it's a, it's a recreation of the photos of the house, he's looking up to his wife. Every photo is looking up to her. And it's amazing, it's unusual, actually. In photography, it, it's often dead on. But you could see the conveying of his, like, the intimacy and love. It was like both how she was depicted, but also every photo was like reverence for her in these images. And I saw that was such a chart. It was such a lovely vision of intimacy. So we know that these concepts of images map in really particular cultural and social ways that convey um, reverence or power or love or other elements. Um, then we can also do this to explore the breadth of the collection. So they have all kinds of other objects you can get. And um, some of them don't make any sense. Like a, uh, there are no, uh, there's, I don't think there's a surfboard going on in here. Um, uh, the, you know, some of them are, and that's one of the challenges with some of this um, is it can be very, um, it can be the way they see things can be a bit specific to 21st century ways of seeing, um, like a, a TV. Um, there's no TVs. Um, so, but it helps us start to use these as a theme to identify different themes in the collection. I like to think of this as a bit of, um, it just allows us to bucket into different themes. And this, allow, uh, this offered some ways of seeing, like, Things we just didn't know were in the collection, like images of birthday parties or uh, people hanging out on their bikes and just other ways of everyday life that are sort of documented in there that are offering another perspective into life during that day, the sort of every day. And for photography right now, photography scholarship, um, focus on the vernacular and the everyday is a really big area of scholarship right now. That's kind of a big, a big part of um, where the field has been going. So what we can do by using some of these methods is to think about what, to what degree they're really following the government's call. We can see how they are to a certain degree, but just how certain photographers are kind of going their own way and saying, hey, you know what? Thanks for the camera. Thanks for the film. But I'm going to do my own. I'm going to photograph what I want. <laughs> um, and the other is that we can see how uh, they can start to see the different styles that they have. They didn't really have a clean style. There wasn't one, each photographer wasn't really trained the same way. So there's not like a visual, like um, uh, there's a variance that allows the different photographers to have a bit more control over what they see. And then we can sort of see, start to see the sort of every day in the historic that starts to see this collection in new ways. And I'll show one thing that we then did was we didn't use the image segmentation algorithms, but we did build, um, so that's some scholarship that looks different. But this is a project that we did to open up the archive as well. 
that um, uses another computer vision, another form of distant viewing inside of it. And that is that you can actually now explore all the photographs, but when you dive a little deeper into a state and see a particular area, you're going to see um, below, in a second below, an individual photo. Uh, it's going to say similar images. And so we actually used an embedding model to actually suggest which photos are like the others. And so it actually lets you now, we have some insights we've done, but we've built it into an exploratory tool using computer vision, using our distant, doing distant viewing to actually let people then explore the collection themselves. And this actually is just based on image similarity. There's no, it's not based on any information about the captions or anything like that. It's just based on which photo is like the other, um, which is a type of um, distant image embedding. And then it allows you to keep moving through the collection. So some of our work is about, I think some of the powers of distant viewing as work is that you do answer specific questions that animate our scholarship, but we also um, have using it to say, think about how does a large, a large national collection get opened up in new ways to be explored for other researchers and other, th other pieces. Um, I think this is what, uh, Miguel, you call data-driven versus data-assisted. Would that be a fair? Sure. Yeah, OK. Um, so I'll pause there for a second. I was going to show you another example in a second if you wanted, but I'll see if there's any. Got everyone still, we're still in there? Got it, yeah. I have a quick question. When you were talking about visiting the National Gallery and seeing these, um, um, the image of the, the man's photos in yeah. the room, to what extent are you acknowledging that like your own interpretation just then was purely cultural and that you're assuming that that's reverence in the upward angle yeah. of the camera and all of that? And so I wonder about that because that seems to me to go into this cliche of coded bias. Like that's another, if you're, if you're yeah. looking at angles like that and attaching tags to those like reverence or honor or something like oh, yeah. that, so I'm wondering how that fits into this kind of creating these algorithms that work. Yeah, no, totally. Uh, so we don't, we just would do something like it's, it's pointed, the camera's pointed up or pointed down, and then we'd use knowledge of the photographer or US visual culture or whether cultural, you know, um, deep knowledge of the cultural ways of seeing that shape different cultural places. So. You know, I wouldn't encode that into a thing. That was my reading of it, you know, but no, yeah. I, honestly, that's why I'm here because I don't really know how you build these computational models. And yeah. also, I'm wondering whether or not in things in, like that end up coming into play as you build so that oh, angle yeah. becomes coded in specific sorts of ways. So we would do that independently. So we wouldn't, I wouldn't rebuild into the data set that that's, that that's Esther Budley's reverence. I wouldn't go in and write reverence next to her photo. I would say, all of these photos are pointed up. They have a lot of sky. Let me pull them all and look at them and say, OK, I know who Esther Bubbly, I know her background. This makes this, that's really interesting. That, but I wouldn't build it into the data set. Yeah. 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 I think you have to be, you're totally right. You have to be so careful about that. That's where people get in trouble. Yeah. Um, so I'll give one more example here, which is some work we did for the Library of Congress, which was just some post detection work. And this is, again, coming back to this theme of opening up collections. Um, we started to look at what Pose could do. Um, and we worked with a collection of uh, photography from the early 20th century as well. That's kind of when um, studios move, when units or organizations move from um, studio photography, so when you like sit and they have the background and you know, take your picture, to news journal. So a lot of studios to stay active and not lose their career as people get their own cameras, they move into journalism. They move, move into news photography. So they provide photos to you know, the local newspaper and they become syndicated um, news um, organizations, uh, photo organizations. And so we just became, this is some preliminary research we've been working on, thinking about pose and how we might be to start to look at photos and images and how their poses are working. And do certain photographers have certain ways that they pose people? Do they always point left? Do they always point right? Do they look up? Do they look down? Um, and then you could think about this in contrast with the foreground background. And I think one of the things that's really interesting, which is, this is about some of the cautions of starting to use these materials, is how um, they start, to, they make a lot of assumptions. So like, for example, pose algorithms, often they want to build the legs. They want to make legs, and there's no legs here, right? 
And I think we could think of this as like an ableist vision, right? This is the ways that algorithms get built. They don't accommodate for other ways of bodies being in the world. They have to have all, they have to have every, the idea of the ideal body. So as we're thinking about the future of these algorithms, thinking about the different ways that people inhabit the world and how they're encoding, even something seemingly maybe um, uh, basic as like what's the body look like is full of assumptions of viewing about what that looks like. And so we could see here, what we started thought was really interesting was how no matter what pose detection algorithm we use, it wanted to build, totally build the, whole, the full body. And we started to think about that in terms of, again, looking for formal elements such as aiming, angles, framing, and symmetry in the future. And um, thinking about how you might start to see where people are in the image. Uh, are they looking at each other? And the thing we're particularly excited about this for is actually television work. So we work on sitcoms. And uh, one of the things that happens, some of the visual semantics of US sitcoms, um, is that, for example, um, when you're looking at the screen, um, action is a bit from like, you're basically often looking at from kind of left to right slightly. Not fully, but that's kind of because of English readers are left to right. So the person who's often on the left side of the screen is often considered to have more power in relation to the person on the right side of the screen. And so we're thinking about how you might be able to use pose algorithms to think about the role of the body and the delivery of um, and television and film as we not just think about angles, but the ways that people are positioned in relation to each other as a way to think about the visual the visual power of film and television. So just something, I think that's a totally open area of research. And if anyone is excited about it, I'd be totally, <laughs> come talk to me. Uh, but <laughs> yeah. Um, how much of that, like, let's say, um, we're, we're attributing a lot of artistic expression uh, and in, as an interpretation of the images. Yeah. Uh, now in, there are, in the world, there are a lot of bad pictures, right? Uh, yeah. There are a lot of bad photographers, uh, including me. Like I'm a yeah. <laughs> so if we, if someone interpreted interprets my just a random picture as a as a form of artistic expression, as a form of like mm -hmm. looking at power balances, and uh, how does that like that bad data? How does that impact your your work? So I think there's a few, a few pieces to that. One is that we're really careful about our corpus. Like I can assume if I have all of the films of Scorsese or like he's pretty meticulous, right? Like if I have a sitcom, I know that there's a, a series of decisions that are sort of formal in the form. So we, um, we're not just throwing in random material from YouTube or random photos we find in random places. It's not that, it's kind of curated to the set the questions that are animating that area of study. But I think the other thing to think about is that, so, um, in Stuart Hall's philosophy of media, we encode meaning into images, and then we decode meaning from images. But what one intends to encode into that meaning, what they intend for the message of that photo to be, may not be what the person who interprets it intend sees. And so sometimes people make bad photos or don't do great work, but they, they click in to a way of seeing that they may not even know they've done, and they've, they are part of that, way, that world. So it's not always that the intentionality is not always as important, or whether my subjective, con what's a good and bad photo is, I, we try to be really careful about, because that kind of gets into high culture, low culture debates, or, or things like that. Um, so, but if it's an image that's functioning in the world that people are engaging with, it has some sort of cultural power. Is that? Yeah. I think with democratization of technology, yeah. that, that, that corpus, like it said, it, it, for America, you had a series of you know, selected photographers that were sent out to you know, all, the you know, the, all the parts of the yeah. country. Now, now, we, now we have, like, everyone has a phone. Yeah. Like, that democratization of technology will make it, like, infinitely more harder to even identify and filter the good ones and the bad ones. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're not really in the game of filtering good or bad or making that decision. But I would say that if you like are on Instagram and the you know, and you are in certain circles, you see certain ways that people want to take their images. Or if you're on TikTok, there's a different tropes. There's different uh, there's different WhatsApp. I mean, sorry, different things on um, Be Real. So each of them has slightly different. And you know, like 
often I think know an Instagram photo when I see one. You know, you learn the like tropes and like and ask any 16 year old how to take a photo for Instagram. They will tell you exactly what to do. They'll turn the camera upside down. They're gonna start like in certain cultures and there's, these are culturally specific by community, but like they will, so we develop all these ways of seeing that and that's what we're more interested in. Not that whether it was a bad photo, it's that they all developed, that a community developed a way of wanting to take photos that does a certain thing or the Kardashian effect, depending on how you think about these things. Yeah, yeah, too soon? Okay. Huh? <laughs> Unsupervised? Un do we do unsupervised training? Learning. 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 Oh, we do some supervised learning. Um, so we'll label some things for a particular, pr we're trying to get particular historical people in an archive, like we might want civil rights leaders, so we'll do some tagging and training. We'll do some of that. Yeah, so you can definitely do that for most of these. You can, you can tweak and, yeah. Yeah. But particularly depending on what you're excited about. Um, I was looking at time here, so I want to be sensitive. Are we uh, yeah. should wrap up here? Oh, well, we've got the whole afternoon for the workshop. Later. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just want to be sensitive of everyone's capacity. Okay, or you know, everyone wanting to stand up. So um, we did. So, so this is just a, some of that pose work we did. We tried to see if um, uh, this is that challenge with it. We tried to just see if certain people focused one way or another in this collection, and it turned out there was no pattern here. But I think these are the kinds of questions that we've, we're, like, we're getting more interested in. Is like, do these change over time? Are there certain tropes? Are there certain ways of uh, portraiture? Uh, and one of the reasons we're focusing on portraiture is portraiture is considered a very powerful form of photography. And na uh, communities use portraiture to take back power from other groups. Like they use it to like, assert their authority and sense of place. So portraiture has a particularly powerful place in art and visual culture. So that's just an example of trust trying to see if there's some interesting ways or patterns that we're not, this case didn't see any, but I think that that's the kind of work that we still have a lot of space to do and think about, is to think about even these kind of open questions. Um, and so coming back to the critical, or just thinking, thinking about distant viewing, um, this is a, a visualizer we built for the Library of Congress, and I think one thing to keep in mind is that it doesn't always work. There's a lot of area expertise that comes into interpreting the, the annotations that come from these algorithms, and to always remember that they really they only see so much. So this is a capacity. This is what we built to kind of show when we have computer vision, it's not seeing everything. It's only seeing so much at a given point, and depending on the ways we train it to see. And I think this is really important also as we think about um, as these computer vision systems are being implemented. Um, in all kinds of different spaces uh, that the humanities has a lot to offer to remind people about how limited it sees and how little these things can see. And, and when they're wrong, if they're not confident enough, there's real stakes for some of this. So this is, uh, this is just effort here to sort of begin to think about how we can visualize and build tools that help us get under the hood and see the limits but also possibilities of some of these materials. Um, so last little, two little pieces, three, I guess a few here. Um, we've been putting a lot of this stuff into what's called the distant viewing toolkit. So to make it easier for people to work with, we put in face detection, image segmentation, all these different ways that you can, you can do with just a few lines of code. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in the workshop. I'm going to have you get into Python on your computer. So we'll be hands on. And, our, and um, we're working on that toolkit for folks um, as you um, if you're excited about this work. And we just got a major grant from a US funder called the Mellon Foundation to try to make it more of an easy to use toolkit that you can click. So more to come on that. Um, and it's built like this. It, the toolkit just does that annotate part for you, which I think comes back to the question we got earlier about, um, you know, do we then say that's a photo of reverence or not? Um, the, the toolkit just does the annotate part then you've got to go into R, Python, or something like that and interpret the results and use all of the frames that we bring as scholars or historians or you know, your, the, whatever is exciting you or interesting you, uh, bringing of interest to you. And uh, this is uh, the visualizer as well that's built into this. So you can launch this, and it will show you what the algorithm decision making is in the toolkit for the out of the box. So if you want to play with that, you'll be able to do that. 
Um, this is Friends. We've done some fun work on Friends. If you're into that TV show, we can talk a little bit about that. Uh, so um, any Friends fans? No? Yeah, I see a few. OK, good. Oh, yeah. OK. There's always, hey. All of my students are rewatching it in the US, and it's kind of wild. They're all like, I have, they've all rewatched like every episode. They like binge watch during the uh, during the pandemic all of all of Friends. It was a real. It's, yeah, it's been interesting. Um, and this is a tensor flow. So this is um, optical flow showing movement in the image. Those are some other things you can do. And so then uh, finally, I'll just end um, with the last piece here, which is about interdisciplinary collaboration and credit. All this, I don't do all this work on my own. <laughs> Nobody is a unicorn. <laughs> uh, you don't have, the, like, I think, the expertise that it takes. This is all collaborative lab-based teamwork with uh, a data scientists, other media scholars. We really work together. And um, I've been doing that since graduate school. And I'm happy to talk a little bit about that, if that's of interest, about the labor and credit, about learning from, in my graduate training, actually starting to be trained to learn how to collaborate with other scholars to build things, and being supported for that. And then also collaboration and credit, making sure that we credit everybody, whether it's through paid, they get authorship, whether it's finding, you know, that everyone's getting credit for their labor and their work, and that the people who do the tech side, and this probably don't have to tell this group, but the people who do the tech side are intellectual interlocutors. They're not just, it's not just tech, these are, the te computational methods are evidence in their ways of thinking, and they're key to what we produce and how we make, how we all work together. So I think one thing as we move forward, thinking about all these ways that new technologies and research can support, um, it's really thinking about our labor and where we publish and how we do it in ways that are equitable and um, support everyone involved. And again, that the everyone's in, that it's about collaboration and a team. So. On that note, I hope that um, you might be excited about doing some distant viewing with me. So thank you. <laughs>